Okay, one of the uh, topics that I wanted to talk about in this particular video, I got the idea a couple of days ago, uh, involved religious cults and the way they hijack terminology and make it their own. Uh, one of the prime examples, I guess, that uh, first come to mind uh, when I was thinking about doing this one uh, was the term spirituality. You know, I've said before in other videos that even though I have my own set of private personal beliefs and even though I don't really, uh, I don't really express them on here because I don't think that that's really uh, has anything to do with the topic of addressing the religious cult of AA. I've mentioned that, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, my involvement in certain uh, I guess you could, well, pagan organizations, and if I was talking to pagans, and if I was at a pagan gathering, which I, I'm not, I would, you'd, you'd probably get a more in-depth idea about what I think and what I believe, but it would be a very complex and probably boring thing to most ordinary people out there, and uh, I, what I was, the point I was trying to make with that is that the word spirituality to me still is cringeworthy, it's a word that I still don't like to use, but the word spirituality, as it would be defined, I guess you could say, in, in everyday ordinary human life, uh, would have nothing to do with uh, submitting your will in your life to the care of some cult to do your thinking for you. I don't think too many people would describe spirituality as the destruction of your individual thinking, uh, of your ability to be independent, of your uh, ability to think for yourself. Uh, I don't really see spirituality is being something where you self-abase all the time and talk about how worthless you are without outside help of some higher power that you have to bow to on a daily basis. There's nothing remotely spiritual about that from my own perspective. I guess uh, you could actually argue that spirituality, the word spirituality, since it doesn't have really a, a clear a uh, clear-cut definition could almost be abstract to the point of being meaningless. Uh, oftentimes in philosophical discussions, uh, before you're actually able to get into a philosophical discussion, you have to actually define terminology. Uh, for example, the word spirituality, if you were going to use some of the, <clears throat> the bold assertions that AA makes about the word spiritual, uh, they're easily dismissed because AA never does really create any kind of clear-cut, mutually agreed-upon definition of what spiritual means. I mean, all you're listening to in terms of the word spiritual is a bunch of uh, rambling uh, by Bill W. You know, the whole chapter on we agnostics is more or less just a way to sell you more cult religion, which I don't call spiritual. I don't call abusing uh, members by dealing drugs to them or exploiting them uh, monetarily and sexually. I don't call that very spiritual either. But the, the whole topic of this video wasn't actually going to be on the word spiritual. It was actually more about hijacked terminology. There was a little bit of a minor uh, debate about, say, the use of the word disease. And, you know, I never use the word disease in connection with addictive behavior. I don't personally... Uh, I don't personally see addictive behavior as even resembling what I would consider a disease. Now, before I got to to AA or Quackaholics Anonymous, a disease to me meant something that, you know, like a physical ailment, something that, you know, could put you down physically, you know, uh, or mentally, like mental illness. I, I mean, I, I guess I never really d defined mental illness like, say, schizophrenia or... Uh, or depression uh, as a disease, really. I always kind of define that as mental illness. I didn't ever use the word disease too much in connection with mental illness. Uh, in my own personal experience, I never did. But I would, you know, broadly cl classify that as being a disease. That doesn't mean that I'm the only one who decides the term uh, disease. I mean, you know, you could get into the semantics of it, if, you know, like the argument about, well, it. If you look at the Latin derivatives, it means not at ease. Well, I mean, you can analyze and cut down the word disease until it becomes totally meaningless. I mean, you could, if you're going to use the word disease for people who shop too much or, or people who, you know, maybe eat too much candy, then a disease uh, would cease to lose any meaning whatsoever. Everything and anything and all things could be a disease. But I think for me, uh, in terms of like, uh, the word disease uh, and, and alcoholism, 
Uh, to me, I would not use those terms because those terms have been ruined uh, by the religious cult of AA. Uh, the religious cult of AA doesn't define disease the same way, say, the medical community would or, or the way that if you really wanted to to really get into semantics and talk about, you know, not being at ease is a disease. I mean, I don't, the AA community doesn't define it that way either. Uh, but, you know, to me, if you're going to go into etymology of a word to use it for a definition, I mean, we're getting to the territory uh, of being silly. I mean, think about it. If the word disease literally means not at ease, uh, then that means when I get up at five o'clock in the morning and I don't want to go to work, okay, and I'm getting ready and I'm thinking about I really just don't want to be at work today. I really don't feel like getting out in the freezing cold weather and trying to go to work and deal with those people. Then technically that would be a disease as well. So, I mean, somewhere along the way you would need some clear-cut definition if you want to give meaning to a word. It's kind of like the way AA members will often go on and on about romance and finance. And I mean, the broad, ambiguous way that they lump everybody into these gross generalizations uh, it's it's useless. It's meaningless. Uh, but the term disease, as defined by AA, I mean, I would say is totally is totally useless to the point that there's no point in using it at all. AA defines disease. Uh, what is it in their phony doctors' opinions? Is something to do with the mind and the body? And, but they go on into some spiritual rambling and some half-ass attempt at phony psychology to more or less tied together this idea that you're as a as an individual you have to surrender your independent thinking uh, that you have to surrender your independent will that your instincts are horrible that your ego is an evil thing you have to surrender all those things to some imaginary higher power in order to ever hope of having a productive life that's AA's definition of a disease. And I mean, if you're going to use the word alcoholism is a disease and you're speaking of it in terms of AA, then I mean, it, no, I would definitely not call uh, addictive behavior, drinking too much or doing drugs, even if it's, you know, even if it's like my own drinking where you drink yourself into freaking homelessness, I still wouldn't call that a disease uh, that's only uh, put into remission by some spiritual blabber that actually, that has nothing to do with anything more than just submission to cult dogma. I mean, if the longer I'm away from AA, the, the more uh, that I can see, even when I have to delve into the literature from time to time uh, for the purpose of making these videos, the more I actually realize that underneath the whole entire convoluted nonsense is just this, this uh, can be summed up in a real simple message, you know. You're broken, you're useless, and you need to surrender to us for the rest of your life. I mean, that's really the overall general message of AA, in spite of all their little fancy daily reflection readings and all their uh, gobbledygook from the 12 and 12, which is utter garbage, I can dissect that. But ultimately, it's just you as a human being are, are useless. And, you know, you're driven by fear and resentment, which is normal human emotions, I might add, and that your ego is, is terrible, which, I, by the way, uh, having a healthy ego is a, a part of any normal functioning human being. I don't need to claim that that's some kind of assertion. I think I've got enough psychology books uh, that I could delve into right now that would agree with me on that. Um, and the, uh, you know, and that you have to just you, you have to give up everything that you want to be everything you hope to be and you just have to be filled with all of this dogmatic brainwashing and in terms of uh love for example i think love is a good word that you could say that gets abused by religious cults as a matter of fact if you you know, people in abusive relate in an abusive childhood have often, in some things that I've read before, uh, back when I used to look at psychology today, I don't look at it as much as I used to, would talk about how they would develop twisted ideas about love due to the fact that, you know, when you're, say when you're beaten up and locked in a closet, or say when you're, you know, uh, starved, or when you're really traumatized by, you know, physical pain, uh, with, with one of your parents and the parent tells you they love you, that sends you a really screwed message. It's kind of like, you know, with spouses, 
uh, who are abused that develop unhealthy uh, feelings about themselves or they uh, develop, uh, you know, their self-confidence gets broken. The abusive person in the relationship would tell that person that they actually love them when in truth they're being uh, anything but love. As a matter of fact, you could say that that's very self-evident in Alcoholics Anonymous because the minute you, you don't talk like the cult, uh, the minute that you don't go along with the lingo, the minute that you don't bow and obey to every old whiner's whims or whatever it is, then you find out that the so-called unconditional love they preach to you when you walk in the door, you know, one alcoholic helping another, uh, you know, it's just one drunk trying to save another drunk. You find out all that goes out the window. And uh, I don't even think that the cult members in their deep brainwashing even, <clears throat> that they even realize what they're doing. It, it, what they're really doing is they're punishing people. It's not so much for the drinking. It's not so much uh, uh, for saying something that, that goes contrary uh, to something that they might hold dear. What it, what it really boils down to is they're being, uh, they're punishing these people for violating the sacred uh, the sacred concrete rules that the cult has put in place that says they cannot be violated. I don't even know if uh, a lot of the people, I think really with the old timers, a lot of them, I've been, I've done so many videos on them. I think they're just uh, predators that just go to AA for the sole purpose of using it for ulterior motives. But I don't think actually AA true believers are aware of their, their own program and are aware of their own brainwashing to the point that you know, if they hear something that goes against a dogma, if they hear about somebody who quits drinking on their own uh, without the program, they automatically go into this hostile, angry, defensive mode. And what they don't realize, I think personally, now, you know, I'm not going to make a, a bold assertion and say this is absolute, uh, but I'm, I'm actually uh, just, uh, I'm not even, it's not even a theory I'm trying to do here. I don't have enough concrete evidence to call it a theory. It's just a hypothesis. But I would say that your your identity is so tied up into the cult religion itself that your own, you know, your own uh, description of who and what you are is so deeply embedded into the religious cult that you actually can't extricate yourself from it as, as an independent human being any longer. That, you know, you're, you know, when the when the cult is questioned, or when the AA program is questioned, it, it's almost like a personal uh, attack, a personal vendetta upon them. Uh, you know, I can't really recall in, in the days of my brainwashing, uh, I, I can't really recall, it's been so long ago since I was actually 100% brainwashed into believing everything AA said that I can't recall if, if anything about you know how I would have reacted. I remember when I first discovered the Orange Papers, for example, online, uh, I already had uh, doubt. I already had this kind of feeling that all was not right within the cult itself. It's almost like these um, these bad science fiction movies where uh, you know you you the the people like in kind of like the Twilight Zone they visit another planet and the planet is just positively utopian. You know, it's a heaven on earth, and uh, of course it's it's never what it appears to be. And it was almost kind of like that when I was starting to doubt AA. It was like there's something about all of this that uh, I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, but you know, there's something about this that I just really don't like at all. So I, I can't really 100% say how I would have reacted in my brainwash days if someone had come along and said, you know, uh, AA is a cult. I, I don't know if I would have freaked out like these these people do that behave so irrationally or hatefully. I mean, it's really difficult to deal with with, with AA people when they're when, as, as hateful as they're capable of being. Uh, uh, but uh, the point that I was actually trying to drive at there is the the terminology is so hijacked, the thinking is so hijacked that I believe that they truly are unable to look at themselves as independent beings, free. Uh, from the slavery of religion, you know, I mean, think really what they, what they say in their readings a lot of times, they'll say freedom from the bondage of self. Well, you know, I used to hear that in meetings all the time, and I never really truly liked that uh, uh, overall sentiment, the bondage of self, as though there's something so inherently bad about me that I'm supposed to just uh, melt away uh, everything that that I think I am or who I am or you know all my acquired experiences that make me what I am in favor of what other strangers with totally fucked up lives behind the scenes are telling me I should be 
maybe I saw, uh, I don't know, maybe I, I read too much growing up and maybe I saw too much science fiction. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but there was something about that word bondage of self that just overall seemed uh, very cult-like to me. And uh, I was doing a little browsing around and I was doing a little uh, doing a little research, I guess you could say, for this video because I was trying to find out, you know, I was trying to find out some... Uh, I guess you could say objective evidence for, for what I'm saying on here, what I'm speculating on. And I, I didn't really find, I mean, I didn't spend hours and hours, okay? I mean, if I'd wanted to, I, I guarantee I could have sat down early this morning and I could have combed uh, through the internet and I could have taken notes and I could have done all of that and I could have made this probably a lot better articulated video than what the final product's going to be. But uh, I'm a little bit lazy as my day off, you know, and they've been killing me with hours. Uh, but I did come across uh, something that it's called, it's about leaving religious cults. And it's, uh, there's a guy, his name is John Huddle, who apparently belonged to some religious cult out in, uh, I think it was, I mean, I'm trying to read the page and look at the same time, but it, uh, it's South Carolina, North Carolina. And uh, I know the name of it was some kind of worldwide fellowship of something. It was a religious cult. And it's kind of creepy when I was looking at his blog on here, uh, it hasn't been updated in quite some time, I don't think. I mean, this article's from 2011. Uh, and of course, they don't mention AA. I might have to send them an email and tell them uh, about AA cult, you know. There is a content. I'll put a link to the article that I'm looking at uh, in the video at the bottom. Anyway, um, there was an interesting little write-up that he had on here when he was talking about love thieves and life thieves, he was calling them. Uh, and he actually was touching upon the very same thing I was saying at the beginning of this video about, you know, terminology being hijacked. Uh, but he was mainly going on about the word love and conditional love or unconditional love, how often the religious cults tell you from the get-go, from day one, we love you unconditionally. Uh, but one thing that was unique to, not unique in religious cults, but one thing he was writing about that was unique in his own experience uh, which could have come straight out of the crap that I used to hear at AA meetings was how they'll they'll tell you at the beginning nobody else can understand you like we can. Uh, how many times have you heard in meetings nobody else normal people wouldn't understand addiction. Normal people don't understand drunks. You know, nobody else can understand you the way we can understand you. Uh, nobody else will ever love you the way we will love you. And. Uh, it kind of ties into another article I was looking about, about love bombing and how that's kind of a cycle of emotional abuse. Because, you know, the type of love that they express in these religious cults and in AA, the idea that, you know, we're the only people who can understand you, it's a very fear-based, abusive type of love. Because after all, uh, the minute you stop playing along with their little freaking game and the minute you stop... Uh, you know, you, the minute you think for yourself or question for yourself, you find out that all of a sudden there's a, there's punishment for that. There's repercussions for that, including, you know, ostracizing people, shunning people, uh, uh, downright wicked behavior that goes on both in AA and, you know, his experience with his religious cult. But he was talking about how uh, another thing that struck me is one th uh, aspect of religious cults in general, I'm speaking in generalized times here, is how they... they they steal uh, their love thieves. They steal your life. They steal everything about your own love because uh, how many people do you know of in AA who live totally fucked up horrible lives outside of the rooms, but they don't even seem to be aware of it. It's almost like an old play. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, it was a Samuel Beckett play. It was in the philosophy of absurdity where someone's buried up to their up to their waist in sand and they're, they're apparently not even noticing the situation and just how bad it's getting. And, you know, later on near the end of the play, they're like buried up to here in sand and they're, they're too busy focusing on trivialities to actually see uh, the, the, the dire situation that's going on around them. And what he was, you know, talking about is look how, how quickly the cult starts eating up all your free time. It's almost kind of like the metaphor for the sand rising up, you know. I mean, you could take that also as being, uh, as compartmentalizing how bad things really are. But uh, in the context of what I'm talking about, uh, how quickly the cult 
starts to infiltrate every moment, every hour of your waking life. I mean, you're expected to attend meetings. You're expected to network with people, to stay in contact with people. You're expected to get a sponsor. You're expected to uh, let that sponsor tell you what to do and tell you how to think as based on literature interpretation. I've sat through meetings where people said they didn't read any more books uh, when they first, after they got into AA because there's only one book they needed and that's the AA big book. And that really bothered me. You know, me being a guy that loves to read, that was that was one of my earliest hobbies in life is being a young social misfit is I love to read. I mean, there wasn't no internet around back then, you know. But uh, uh, I've heard people say that they had to give away, uh, they had to box up and, and throw away all their books because, you know, they didn't need those books anymore. That uh, bookstores are filled with books about, you know, improving yourself and helping yourself. And it's pathetic because they got the big book. You know, if you notice, they're just taking little bitty fragments, a little bit at a time. And uh, I wonder how many people in AA have ever stopped and thought about the fact that they don't really have any friends in the outside world. You know, when I when I first got out of the cult of AA, I, I actually uh, looked at my friends list one time on social media, and I realized that the only people I networked with, the only people I interacted with for the majority of the time was cult members. And I got rid of... I, I, that was one of the few times I actually had to, you know, do that. What is it? Sometimes people uh, announce, you know, I have to clean up my friends list. Well, that was one time I actually did. I got rid of 90% of them. And it's just little fragments here and there. They keep taking and they keep taking and they keep taking. And of course, all of this is done in the name of, you know, uh, the, the goodness of the program. The program cares about you. The program loves you. We love you. You know, we understand you. Your family could never understand you. Outside world could never understand you. Your job will never understand you. Only us. You know, you must devote all your time to us. And there is almost like a replacement high in the meetings. You know, they come in there and they say, well, I needed this meeting today in the same in the same manner that they'd say I needed the, you know, I needed my vodka on the rocks when I got off work today. And it's all a replacement, gradually, slowly, but surely for everything. And you genuinely, you know, if you're brainwashed totally and completely, you genuinely believe that you love the cult. You genuinely believe that you love the, the fellowship and the people and all of that other stuff. And you're unable to, uh, unable to objectively look at reality any longer because they've hijacked the word love. They've hijacked uh, the word friendship. They've hijacked... Uh, words like, you know, peace or anything like that. Everything has been hijacked and taken over, twisted and manipulated uh, to the point that it all comes back to AA. I mean, you know, how many people do you see in AA? I never had a true friend in my whole life until I got to AA. I never had a, a, a true soulmate until I got to AA. I never understood love until I got to AA. I never had any compassion until I got to AA. And that's kind of where the author here on this article about uh, religious cults and, and, the, and the talk about stealing love uh, goes on and takes it one step further and says it's stealing life. They steal your whole entire life out from underneath you. They steal your thinking and they steal your life where you're, you know, and you're so deeply embedded a lot of the times that you really can't, you know, extrapolate from, from the situation enough to realize that they you know, by degrees of love bombing and by taking over the way they do, that, it, that you've completely lost your grip on any kind of objective reality. And, uh, you know, that you're, uh, when it comes to terminology, uh, once it's, you know, you're, what is it I'm trying to say on that? It was almost kind of like uh, something I read once in Animal Farm where it said they wanted to argue against the, the regime, but they couldn't find the adequate words to do it. I realized that part of my cult deprogramming, uh, part of getting away from it, uh, was trying to figure out some way to reclaim terminology because there was so much in it that that really, you know, all I had was almost like negative reactions to it. I was almost the opposite of Pavlov's dogs. You know, Pavlov's dogs would salivate when a bell would ring. Uh, when I would hear spirituality, I literally uh, would, would almost want to just rage, you know, when I would hear something about service, you know, in service uh, to anything or doing service for someone else. I would just go, you know, almost into just this utter cringe of, you know, it was like a, a physical uh, 
reaction to words that they had taken over. And I realized that those words had been twisted in it a long time ago before actually entering into the cult of Quackaholics Anonymous. Uh, they don't, none of those words really bothered me, uh, and it was part of my own cult conditioning. I mean, even when you realize a cult is bullshit, and even when you see that the, the whole entire thing is phony and it's crap and you, and you get away from it the way I did, it would be a lie to, to say that it's, it's not going to have psychological holdovers, it's psychological problems. Not really so much problems in the, in the sense of, you know, you, you're uh, unable to function normally in life, but almost, almost like a mild form for me of PTSD. I mean, where... Uh, you know, it took some time to actually get kind of a clear-headed feeling again where I realized that uh, I could actually, uh, you know, take pride in my work and not have to hear the word pride as some kind of ugly, nasty uh, thing that I could actually uh, uh, talk to the therapist that I went through CBT with about ego and realize that ego is not some vile, ugly, horrifying word, that uh, having an ego is actually a healthy thing, that I could hear things like... Uh, independent thinking and doing things on my own and having my own willpower without having to have this allergic reaction to it because uh, for so long I heard words like, you know, self-will run riot and, you know, uh, self-will this and self-will that. By the way, there's no such word in the English language, I don't really think. That's another common characteristic of cults. They'll uh, twist uh, definitions around and create them into something they're not. They'll pervert the meanings of certain words like desire desire in there is is what is it in their fucking 12 and 12 they talk about uh you know, far e exceeding their intended purpose well uh, well who's fucking intended purpose bill wilson i mean you know a shining example of how to be a good person look at bill wilson's life utter scumbag that guy you know and I realized that in some ways, uh, when I started to, to kind of, you know, go through some ideas and run through some ideas in my head for making this video, of, uh, and even today I'm still in the process of reclaiming uh, certain words and certain phrases and certain feelings and emotions, you know. Uh, I've gone through phases where I've had former cult members say something about, you know, you're just so angry, you're angry when you talk on there, you're angry. and. You know something, there's nothing freaking wrong with being angry. There's nothing freaking wrong with being selfish sometimes. There's nothing freaking wrong uh, with being egotistical. There's nothing freaking wrong with any of these things. These are normal processes of being a normal human being. And it's, it's one of the truest telltale signs, I think, uh, of AA as a religious cult that it really is. I mean, what other organization, if it had your... your uh, your well-being at heart would, would hijack every feeling that you have and every emotion that you have and every thought that you have and twist it around to where you're in a place of uncertainty and you cannot operate. Uh, you know. Anyway, I think that's about, that's going to be about all for now. But, uh, yeah, I guess uh, this video, the overall topic is reclaiming, reclaiming your emotions, reclaiming terminology and, and realizing that the definition of words have absolutely nothing to do with what some fucking con artists like Bill Wilson claimed that they were to be. And I guess I'll see you guys pretty soon next week, hopefully. I don't know if they got me on another 80-hour work week or not, but we'll just uh, stay tuned for now.